What would you do if I told you that America is and always has been a theocracy? Let's talk about that as we watch our culture stray further every day. What you believe about God dictates how you will think. Our philosophies dictate how our culture behaves. Politics is simply the enforcement of cultural norms. The truth claims about God, philosophy, culture, and policies will affect what we value. When these things are in alignment, revival is possible. And hello there, and welcome to Further Every Day, the podcast where we explore current events through the lens of the Christian worldview. Today, Mr. Steve and I are just hanging out here, him in the chair of culture and me in the chair of politics. How are you? Hi, man. I'm doing great, John Arthur. Yourself, dude. Doing well. Doing well. So today's a special episode. We're going to just kind of hunker in and focus down on what is America? And I think to understand what America is, it's good if we go ahead and go back to where we came from. Part of the problem today is that you have a secularist, humanistic reinterpretation of history based on a right. 21st century lens. Right. Yeah, I, I would completely agree with you on that. The way the secularism is has been spreading, especially in the, in the colleges nowadays and the way it's taught. And it started in the <coughs> 1800s. It started yes. in the 1800s with Yale and Harvard, Christian universities. Correct. Correct. And we, we allowed them in, and they started to rewrite the history. And this, this is where it's really important to, to study, like the Bereans, to show yourself approved. Uh, it's, it's critical to be aware of where we came from, what happened. And by the way, history unvarnished is really important. Uh, if I can borrow from Bill Maher, you know, the guy, I disagree with him on just about everything. But he did say <laughs> something right. He said, you know, if you're for teaching history unvarnished, I'm I'm great I'm good for it but if you want to teach kids to be guilty because of the color of their skin that you know I didn't I didn't hold slaves and you know it, it, it's the same with me it's like I, I had family on both sides of the Civil War I had family yeah. members who were liberators um, uh, in 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 Auschwitz right in Dachau and you want to tax and penalize me for something that I wasn't even my family members weren't even here for some of the slave trade. So you want to penalize yeah. us. Some of, so, some of the Irish were brought over on, on uh, slave ships. Right. So, you know, you, you, you want to penalize for that, and you want, you want to say that America was distinctly racist. Well, it, it's, it's not distinctly racist because everyone was in that sin at the time, but that's not an excuse. It is, however, distinctly Christian. And, again, let's, let's go ahead and dig in here. It is a theocracy let me explain bear with me and we'll and we'll, we'll get there when we left england for the new world it was under persecution the pilgrims specifically left england for the new world because king james the second was not a fan or a friend to the protestants and tyrannically he was oppressing them they came from a feudal system where you had people who you couldn't move your class. You couldn't change the destiny or trajectory of your life. You could not own anything without fear of the king or the lords taking your stuff. And, of course, you couldn't worship the way you wanted to worship. Right, and you paid taxes on pretty much everything. To the point where you annually. could barely subsist. Right, and so, that was the whole idea was to keep them that way, was barely to keep them subsisting so that they had total control. That is the whole idea behind it, control. Exactly. So let's look at how America is today, because I'm going to make an argument, and, and you may not realize where I'm going, but bear with me. We're going to make an argument here that our culture and our body politic, because we got rid of the theological constructs, the chair of theology, the philosophy, because we abandoned that, we're now in a situation where we are slipping back into a centralized government that is taking away your rights and privileges as though it is God. So let's make the case. Uh, if you don't believe me when I say that the government, just like the British government, would prevent you from changing jobs or living in a certain occupation, you don't believe me, try to practice law without a law license. <laughs> <laughs> Try to go in and represent, go in as someone's legal counsel, go in and, and say, Hey, uh, you know, I, I, here's the law I've studied. I went to Harvard. I went to Yale. I just didn't, uh, I didn't go for the bar exam because I don't, 
I didn't want to. Tried just saying that in front of a judge. You're going to have a heck of a time. Uh, yeah. They want to license your ability to work in that occupation. Of course, you want to have someone, you know, you want to have a law degree, right? Or, or, or some sort of stamp or recommendations so people can say, yeah, the, the, this person is a competent uh, jurisprudent and I, I can come right. here and I can work, you know, I, I can use this person's services and I won't be defrauded. Something that, that, that shows that you've studied, you know, something where you've, you know, people know that you've studied the law and, you know, you we know have, about what you're talking about. But we have that. It's called right. a degree right and education <laughs> when, when, when when you lock when you walk into someone's law office do you do you think think about this do people say are you licensed no everyone assumes you are otherwise you're going to be put in prison of course they assume that you're licensed they say what are your recommendations what are your cases what have you won what have you lost where have you been where have you worked you know those are the kind of questions that people want to know about a lawyer so the license has very little to do with it it's just the government is deciding whether or not you can practice your chosen profession. If you don't believe that they tax you and that you, you're living on feudal land, try not paying your property tax. Give it a whirl. See what happens. See whose land it really is. Right. We actually had a commenter in one of our comment sections uh, jump in both feet on this, and absolutely, he's correct. Try not paying your property taxes. Try not paying your income taxes. But let me ask you a question. Yeah. If you can tax a right, is it a right? No, it's something that's given to you. It's something that's being bequeathed to you by the government. Certainly. And you're allowed to operate under the government's uh, auspices, and they have the right to tax it. But your right. income, you have a right to income. Your income, it's your work at the sweat of your brow. You have, a, you have a right to that. So where did the government, where did the United States originally get all of its money? Through tariffs and trade. Yes, those are taxes, but they're not a tax on the American people specifically. It affects American people when we're relying on foreign trade more heavily, the, but that is a symptom of a lack of the, tariffs. Through, through the federal government uh, originally getting that money that way, and that's where federalism had come into effect through the way they started our government and that was the whole idea <clears throat> excuse me when uh john madison was writing the federalist papers you know and he discussed all of that about you know separating and having the states having their powers and the federal government having their powers and separating all the powers into to limited, the judici government. limited government exactly precisely so limited yep. limited government so the last point if you don't believe that they're not coming for your religion what are they doing in australia right now and what are advocates saying that we should do here in america for the lgbt movement you, well, you in victoria a province of of australia you can literally be sentenced to prison time in hefty fines for praying for an lgbt person right I'm, I'm, can you imagine if you pray for somebody they for re regardless of the reason and being sent to prison for praying for someone i mean my gosh so it's coming you, it's coming sure. and if you're and if you say that your child is not a baby or the he is not a she or she is not a he and the other spouse wants to perform uh chemical castration and gender mutilation based mutilation, uh, i.e. gender-affirming therapy, guess who's going to get the kid? Not the one who wants to protect their child who is suffering through body dysmorphia and fix the dysmorphia. The person who wants to mutilate the child without addressing the underlying issues for the dysmorphia. And that's a distinctly Christian value set. If you think about this from a secular humanist perspective, if we are just a bulbous mass of tissue and cells, then of course, right now, you need to live your best life and enjoy and self-actualize to the fullest extent. However, if there is more to the human being, if there is more to the human being than just cells, if we are more than animals, then there is something that has given us that distinct difference. There's something 
that has written a law and put it in our hearts. And I would suggest to you that that is a someone. However, they are coming for your religion. And if you don't believe what I'm saying, well, we can look to history. We can look to history. And William Barclay, uh, a biblical scholar, wrote something on Smyrna. We're going to pull that up in just a second. But I want to note that a lot of cultures and religions over the years allowed or tolerated Christianity as long as it wasn't held to the exemption of the state religion or the state. And you see that in the Church of Smyrna. If you remember your Revelations studies, you remember Christ talking to the persecuted Church of Smyrna. And uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to look because they had street in Smyrna, they had a street that was paved in gold with all of the temples to Apollo, Aphrodite, etc. But they also had a temple to Caesar. And what went on there is very interesting. Mrs. Producer, if you can go ahead and get us that slide. Uh, Mr. Steve, you want to read that for us from yeah, let me, biblical scholar let me William right Barclay on okay. Smyrna. Let's see. Emperor worship had began a spontaneous demonstration of gratitude to Rome. But toward the end of the first century in the days of what is Domitian. Domitian, the final step was taken and Caesar worship became compulsory. Once a year, the Roman citizen must burn a pinch of incense in the altar to the Godhead of Caesar. And having done so, he was given a certificate to guarantee that he had performed his religious duty. All that the Christians had to do was to burn that pinch of incense and say, Caesar is Lord. Receive their certificate and go away and worship as they please. But that is precisely what the Christians would not do. They would give no man the name of Lord. That name they would keep for Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. They would not conform. And this is why the church was persecuted in Smyrna. Exactly. When Jesus was talking to them, this is what he was referring to. And if you remember Polycarp, he was the pastor or bishop of Smyrna. I don't know if you know your church history, but Polycarp was burned at the stake for not pinching that little bit of incense. Exactly. And it. That's all he had to do. That's all he had to do. He had to worship at the stake just a little bit, and then he could you know, preach Jesus, do whatever he wanted, but he wouldn't do it. Correct. And... They were going to throw him to the animals, and they said, you know what? Nope, nope, let's just go and burn this man. And they burned him at the stake as an example. So if you don't think that that's not coming here. And he made a uh, a, 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 well, how, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, a similar thing towards with burning at the stake for him was going to be a short time period co compared to what was going to happen to them by burning in hell for eternity. I'm going to have to look that up. That's Man, interesting. yeah. So just be aware. Be aware that it's coming here. So all, all of this is kind of a long-winded introduction to where did the Protestant work ethic and where did federalism come from? Where was this nation founded? It was not founded in slavery as a 1619 project with so much love you to believe go ahead and try to read through the 1619 project and you'll see that there's a, a myriad of just incorrect factually wrong and also colored and twisted uh history if you will however when the pilgrims came here in 1620 you know 1609 you had jamestown they were coming here to meet with the virginia colony unfortunately they got blown a bit north and uh, they landed at Plymouth Rock on November 11th, 1620. And they came from a feudal system. You have to remember, this is, why, this is why we brought it up earlier. They came from a feudal system where they had a lord saying this much at the end of the day. And they took it into the storehouse and they shelled out a little bit of uh, food to each family. Okay. They come here. They're having a hard time farming. But what's worse they're putting everything into a common storehouse from which everyone will be fed. What does this sound like? Sounds like socialism. 
they had that a socialized utmost. distribution yes. of the food. So with the socialized distribution of the food, they began to starve. And there's a very important verse here, uh, 2 Thessalonians 3.10. If you got that for me, go ahead and read that. This changed yes. their minds on the issue of redistributive uh, redistribution of wealth and food. Yes, 2 Thessalonians 3.10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. The reason this was so important to them was because they went through a serious famine, many people died, and they realized, we're putting everything into a common storehouse. There's about 50 people, and by the way, look yep. up David Barton on this. He's a, he's a great resource on this. There's about yes. 50 people working hard in the colony to provide food, and there's about 100 people who are slacking. And because they can, you know, they, they just came out of a tyrannical, awful place, and they're enjoying kind of coasting, not, right? right? Yeah, they're just enjoying and not doing anything because somebody else is feeding them. And hey, it's a great hey. coast until right. famine hit and people should... didn't eat. Correct. So the governor said, um, guys, if you don't work, you don't eat. Start to work. And all of a sudden, guess what happened? People, food was on the table. Man. All of a sudden, everybody's eating. Everybody's got food. Hey, it's amazing how that works out, doesn't it? Just a year later, all of a sudden, everything works. Because guess what? Things take time. It takes time to grow. It takes time to plant. It takes time to furrow and, you know, and uh, prep the land. But once they did all of that, they were able to eat. This is where the Protestant work ethic came from. Correct. We tried it in Jamestown, too. Didn't work in Jamestown. <laughs> you cannot socialize wealth. You can't do it because some people will inevitably slide. That's why you have two kids in one family. One becomes a millionaire and the other never quite, you never quite gets higher than the poverty line. It's just barely above mm -hmm. it, right? Yep. It's an issue of the heart. But uh, where did we get our legal system? It's a good question. I'm glad you asked. Uh, there, <laughs> we got our legal system also from the Bible. And All right. There's a study out of the uh, out of the Houston or University of Houston where fifteen thousand of the different quotes or sorry fifteen thousand of the documents some, uh, sent by our founding fathers whether they be letters or they be uh, articles of uh, confederation etc all those different documents they, they looked at them fifteen thousand thirty four percent of the quotations in those documents came from the Bible. They were directly out of the Bible. So, and by the way, more than any other source, period, hands down. And you start to realize something. Our founding fathers, for a group of atheists and deists, I'm saying this in scare quotes for those of you on audio, it's a very strange thing for them to do. These people believed in the Bible. They believed not only that the Bible was critical, but they also believe that you could not have a society without a Bible-believing, God-following group of people. And they couldn't, especially not a free one. You had to have a strict rod of iron law or open freedom with the Holy Spirit. And just to sort of kind of accentuate that point. There's a great quote from John Adams. He wrote a letter to the Massachusetts militia in October 11th of 1798. Go ahead and throw that up, Mrs. Producer. And if you can read that for me, Mr. Steve. Uh, yeah, let me pull that up. I'll get that one. You get the okay. next one. Because we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions, unbridled by morality and religion, Avarice, ambition, revenge, or gallantry would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for any other. Think about that for just a moment. There's a lot of big words, by the way. By the way, John Adams was a country bumpkin. He was not considered a scholar. Uh, and you read what he wrote and the way right. he wrote it. Uh, by the way, something to be said about the Bible being used as a primer. All of these men and women were raised with a Bible as their grammatical textbook, yeah. King, a King James Bible. Uh, and and 
a number of them were either like uh, different types of religions, you know, various types of Protestants. Oh, absolutely. Or what they were. Absolutely. So what he's saying here is that there is no government that can possibly restrict or restrain the human spirit. You either have to punish people brutally or they have to be a godly people and we can have a free nation. And that's what he's trying to say. John Adams, one of the framers, very clearly, concisely states it here. He's saying that this nation is a nation under God. It will not live long without God in the hearts of the individuals. George Washington also had something interesting to say about this. Correct. And if you can get me George Washington, Mr. Sure. Steve. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim tribute to patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness. These firmest props of the duties of men and citizens, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principles. So let's break that down. What was happening across the ocean during the time of the revolution? What was happening in, in France? What we had going on was a revolution that was happening. Over Another there. one. Um, yeah, man. And they were both sparked by two different parts of the Enlightenment. You've got to remember the, con the historical context. When George Washington is talking about this, he's looking at the French Revolution, and he's looking at the national morality. He's looking at the yes. absolutely heinous debauchery and the murder of citizens over in the French Rev during the French Revolution. This is something that you can see and developing, and, and I don't remember if this is before, during, or after the Revolution, but you could see the thought, and all of these men were reading uh, folks like Locke and Burke and right. uh, uh, Hobbes. They were reading all of these philosophers. And where they came to realize is you cannot have a national morality that will provide freedom and health and prosperity and well-being for the people. You can only have a biblical foundation if you wish to have freedom. Correct. And, you know, talking about freedom, uh, you know, one of the things they'd done in that time, during that time in, what was it, 1791 um, or something like that was they had during that time of the revolution was in the French revolution, they had taken away all of their firearms at mm -hmm. that time. And those people were highly upset and it was, you know, it was enabling the, the French government to be able to have an ability to be able to be over the people, and then, you know, what are they going to fight with? Correct. They're, you know. Correct. So it was a major bloody thing that went on at that time. So where our founding fathers were focused was building a nation that would foster a moral people, and moral, God's morality, not man's, God's morality. And the reason why is is articulated really well by Patrick Henry, if I may. Bad men cannot make good citizens. It is when a people forget God that tyrants forge their chains. A vitiated state of morals, a corrupt public conscience, is incompatible with freedom. No free government or the blessings of liberty can be preserved to any people but by a firm adherence to justice, moderation, temperance, frugality, and virtue, and by a frequent recurrence to the fundamental principles. I, I don't think you can get any cleaner than that. <laughs> it's, a, it, it, it's a clean stroke. And look, sure. these men were not perfect, but they were reading yeah. out of a Bible that was right and you know they knew they were also just as you know sinful as any other man but you know they they realized that 
you know, things needed law and that the government was not the ones that were to control the people, but the people were to control the government. Correct. And that's something you know, that he, the only the people who were godly and God-fearing could possibly control the government in a way that was in a incongruence with freedom. Right. You know, with, with, with without a godly people, freedom is not possible because it will inevitably devolve into tyranny. Correct. And, you know, there's, um, you know, it shows in the Bible in various verses that, uh, you know, talks about federalism. Absolutely. I, I mean, it really does. Federalism came out of the framers' understanding of the scripture. Correct. And what they wanted to do, and, and they looked at Exodus for the judicial system, what Jethro yes. suggested to Moses, and they said, we got to have lower courts and higher courts. And you have a court system where something can progress through. And then there's an appeals court, and there's a double layering of the court that they looked at. And they looked at the reason why you have districts, and then you have state, and you have federal. And the reason why they set up that layered system, they were, A, looking to the chair of theology. B, looking to the chair of philosophy. They can only come up with these concepts after carefully studying the scriptures, but then carefully studying history right. and case law. And what they came up with was a very strong common law system, i.e. natural law or God's law. And that's what's so spectacular about our system. And then at the federal level, we, we left the Articles of Confederation which are still technically in play, but we added the Constitution on top. We added the Constitution on top because we said, look, the Confederation of States uh, that we had from 1776 to 1789, it's just not working. All right? It's just not working. And then we started to, during that time, we, well, it still was technically in effect, I believe, until 1792, because uh, uh, the first Congress was kind of taking over. But 1789 is when it stopped. But the first, first Congress of the new Constitution took over, and they started to work out and hammer out the details and the problems with this new republic, including slavery. They wanted to get rid of it, and all of that led to the horrible three-fifths compromise, etc. But what you had was godly men trying to write into law a nation that was free, but it could only be free if these people were submitted to God's spirit. That's why we're making the case today, you're living in a theocracy. The closest thing there has been since Samuel. You know, Samuel, uh, his sons were very uh, wicked and naughty, and they were doing evil things. And so the people said, look, we want a king. This is in the Bible, in the book of Samuel. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that Samuel says, you're making a mistake. And God says, go ahead and let them. Let them see what a king will do. A king will oppress them. A king will take away their freedoms. King will do all these things. But before that, during the book of Judges, what you had was a nation of people who lived in a free state. And we were allowed to see what happens when those people are not godly. We have stories yep. like the, the Levite sure. and the Benjaminites, where they raped his I'm sorry, they raped his wife uh -huh. until until she was dead, and he said, you know what, this is awful. He cuts her up into 12 pieces, sends them to all different tribes of the Israel, and says, look, this is what's going on right now. In Benjamin, in the, in the uh, region of Gibeah, this is bad. You guys, we have to fix this. This is how evil our nation has become. You get to that point when you ignore God. Right. When you ignore, ignore God, it's just like you said, things get evil. People uh, live in committed sin they live the life of their committed sin they don't think about it it's just a normal life i mean the, you know they don't think oh there's any kind of guilt in regards to it uh it's just a lifestyle just a lifestyle of sin and that's just the way you think without even knowing that it's a sinful life. It's just a normal lifestyle. So that's an, that's an important point that you're making there, is that without a church who is actively sounding the alarm and saying, this is what's good, this is what's evil, this is what's right, this is what's wrong, 
and without a church sounding the alarm on revisionist history, right? what you have is people who are three or four generations now, they've been taught a certain history, and the history is not accurate to what happened, or it is changed and twisted, and they focus not on, on the whole, but on the obscure <coughs> minority. They focus on, and I'm not talking about one ethnicity's history over another. I'm saying they'll focus on the one incident in a hundred years as opposed to the piece of 50. And what they'll do, and they won't focus on who and why that piece was broken, say with the pilgrims. Right. They won't focus on that. They'll just say that, oh, the, it, ended, it ended badly. Well, it la the piece lasted for 50 years. We landed in a war zone when the pilgrims came yeah. across. They landed in a war zone. And they actually brought peace with them through the biblical understanding. Were they perfect? Absolutely not. Uh, yeah. did, did peace come with them? Absolutely so. But you have people who've been taught wrong facts. Ronald Reagan said it really well. He said, the problem with our uh, Democratic friends is that, not that they don't know much, it's that they know so much that it is not so. Correct. And that's what we have to start doing. We have to start breaking down the disinformation. And what's interesting, he was a Democrat at one time. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, you know, he was a so, fan. Of, he was a fan of gun control, <laughs> specifically uh, against blacks. Yes, uh, when he was a you know kind of coming out of that phase. Yes. So yes. I'm I'm just saying, even Ronald Reagan did some pretty bad stuff. You want to know why open carry is not allowed in uh, California? It was to muzzle blacks uh, uh, who were who were protesting their horrible treatment. And that government put that down, and Ronald Reagan but, was right there in the middle of it. Yeah, right in the smack dab middle of it. People can change, and not and no politician's perfect. You 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 want to confront me on Trump? I'll tell you, I love Donald Trump. Can I tell you that uh, there are things that he could have made it a lot easier to support him on? Yeah, he, of course, yeah. of course, he could have well, made sure. it. He could, he could have been a lot easier to support. He could have done a lot of things. Every politician is flawed, and sure. uh, and you know, so you you you, you can point at different things but you want to look at the whole history right and you know nobody's perfect um you you know we're born in sin everybody goes through a time in their life when they have to be saved some people are saved earlier in life some people don't realize it until later on in life and fortunately because of jesus we're given grace and he looks upon us and we realize it at some point in our life that we're a sinful being and we live in sin and we decide, oh my gosh, I need to be saved. Like for myself, I wasn't saved till I was 48. Thank the Lord he continued to knock on my door and look upon me and say, hey, Steve, look, buddy. And I answered the door, opened it up, and said, come on in. Thank you, Lord. And my life has changed immensely. And what's interesting is all of my friends have noticed a change in me over the years. You know, I'm in my 60s now, and it's been an amazing change in my life. There's been so many things that have changed in my life. Well, amen. You and, know. And, that's, and that's exactly what the founders were talking about. They were saying that we needed people who are changed by the Spirit to be effective citizens. So, with that noted, anything you want to say wrapping up? You know, I, I, I'd just like to say that fortunately we had, uh, you know, founding fathers that had the good insight to set this country up the way they did and they used biblical scripture scripture in order to use it to set up our constitution and set it up and use the means by which it was set by laying out the foundation like we did and and use the judicial system the the congress and the presidential system for the use of exactly what we're using it for now. Sure. Nowadays it gets a little, you know, confounded by, you know, bad men, like, and, you know, like the, it talks about, and that's the issue, right? <laughs> you know, with evil men and, 
uh, like the January 6th deal, how they talk about what was going on. You got bad people talking about things. Now, I'm sure, you know, if you got something so, bad to say, even put yeah, it in yeah, the comments yeah, yeah. That's or a whole whatever. Can of worms. You know, that's a whole different concept, a different conversation there in itself. But, um, you know, that just goes to show that they had the foresight to show that a government needs to be run by and for the people and that it needed to be set up and controlled and used and have an, a second amendment. Whereas other countries don't have that sort of thing. And look what happens. Indeed. So what you see here is a founding father set, you know, I was talking with, with someone, I was out teaching a class somewhere and, uh, this, this this guy gets gets up afterward. We're talking about America. It just came up, and uh, the founding fathers came up. And, the, and this this elderly, big, strong, strapping African American dude with a white top. He says, "You know the thing." And and and, and I say this for a reason. Uh, he stands up and says, "Man, our founding fathers they knew what they were doing. It amazes me that they foresaw everything that would happen." how they could change and course correct and how they would set up a nation that would eventually not only make men free, but also survive as long as we stuck to the constitution. There's someone there who went through Jim Crow, right? That man has seen stuff. He, you know, he saw stuff, stuff happened to him, but you know what? He realizes men are evil. God is good. And the only thing that makes this nation good is God in the hearts of the citizens, the right. people. And that is why you've been living in a theocracy the whole time. If you want to go to Canada, go ahead. Enjoy that nine-month wait for a broken leg. Uh, go to I Australia. Just, I just want to say European enjoy, country. <laughs> enjoy the tyranny. Them. Enjoy the tyranny. If you want to join us in the American experiment, understand something. Those of you saying, well, well, what, you want us to live in a theocracy? Uh, yes, yeah. Sherlock, you're living in one. Yes, you're just not realizing it yet. Let's make it clear to you: this has always been a nation under God. That is why it's been a nation under God. It only works if you have a moral, religious people, and they're not talking about religion for religious sake. They're saying, right. "Do you believe and hold these principles of turn the other cheek?" Love your neighbor. Are you reading in the Bible? Are you being changed and transformed by the nature of God's word? That's the only way that you can be an effective citizen of this nation. And without effective citizens, this nation crumbles. So, vote. When you turn 18, get out, register, and vote. Spend time at the voting booth. Spend time researching people's past history, everything about those people that are running for whatever office it is, and vote. Vote, and more importantly than voting, you need to vote. But more important than voting, get out there, be someone's friend. Get into the culture, get to know someone, talk to them. I'm not talking about proselytizing. I'm saying you go in and you make a disciple. Correct. You work with someone. You talk to them. And as you grow in a relationship with them, and as they see Christ's love in you, that's when you can change someone's heart and mind. And that needs to happen. Every Christian needs to do this. Every individual who loves freedom needs to do this. Because if we do not change the culture, you want to know why things are so, you know, you, 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 were, you were talking about why things are so convoluted in Congress. Do you want to know why things are convoluted in Congress, why Congress never gets anywhere? Because the church has not been doing her job. The church has not been a transformative force in the culture. The church needs to become a transformative force in the culture by being that loving, uncompromising, and giving fixture. If the church can be loving without compromising on God's truth and being there, I'm not talking about giving money. I'm talking about being there in someone's life. If the church can do that, 
I don't care who's in Congress right now. We can get them out in two to four years if the nation's still around. We right. can get them out. But you have to show up. You have to show up as part of the church, whether it's in someone's life who's abortion-minded, whether it's someone's life who now they have, uh, they're, they're single with kids, maybe you can be the father figure, or maybe you can help the mom out with, 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 with the chores. You have to be there. And when you are there for someone, that's where you multiply. Because if you disciple them to go and do the same thing, you have just multiplied. You have been fruitful and reproduced. Be a volunteer, John Arthur. Be fruitful, reproduce, volunteer. Yes. Thank you so much. If you've enjoyed this podcast, like, comment, share, subscribe. The sharing button is now the new thing. Copy the link. And uh, if you send it to someone, that's also a bonus. But make sure you copy that link. That is a big deal. Uh, like all those good things. There is a subscribe button down there. That subscribe button doesn't do anything unless you ring the bell. You got to click that little bell. So it goes ding, ding. And now you've got right a notification from us when we post. We are posting shorts. These shorts uh, are doing okay on the YouTube channel. Go ahead and share those around. That way more people can get the snippets and bites. And uh, again... If you're listening to us on the podcast, we are on YouTube now. Uh, if you decide to listen, there's a visual component here. The studio is changing, and I think it's I think it's for the better. I, you know, uh, this yeah. producer and uh, one that, and two. That flag looks good behind you, John and, Arthur. I really like that. And Mr. Steve here, of all, and I've all been working <laughs> on this place. It's getting better. So uh, let us know what you think in the comment section down below. And go ahead, if you didn't like this podcast, let us know why down there too. If you want to uh, yell at us, I'll probably get down there, roll in the mud with you, uh, but not too much. This shirt is white, and so I don't need it to get too dirty. By the way, merch on Amazon. Go ahead. It, you know, it doesn't really support the channel all that much, but at least you get some cool merch. And you know, I'm not going to tell you that uh, Ehud was wearing this when uh, uh, he killed that king in judges but uh, he looked pretty cool while doing it so you might want to get yeah. a shirt just like he could. samson might have been wearing them though yeah but yeah time, but we don't have don't we don't but have that just shirt don't anymore. have a picture of him we don't have that shirt anymore you know he ripped yeah. it off he kind of flexed too much yep. you know these they flex a little bit they breathe really well but uh anyway enough on the shirt uh <laughs> thank you so much we love y'all bye-bye bye all right all right last thing last thing <laughs> what is your favorite story from the founding of the nation a favorite story oh man goodness goodness uh, you know i think one of my favorite is uh probably some of the stuff when knowing about george george washington um coming and praying and spending time praying um after battles and going off by himself into the woods, he would leave and go away from the troops and go off by himself and pray by himself. And the troops always noticed he would pray all of the time. And it's so interesting. I read this in history, and I never realized that because they don't teach that in no. school. No, they don't. They don't teach that in school. And I thought that was one of the most interesting things that he spent so much time praying. Very Christ-like of him, actually. Yes, very much so. Very much on that model. Uh, I got to say, I, 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 while I love the War of 1812, I'm talking about more about the founding. So yes. um, one of the things that I really liked was you, when you're looking at the first Congress of the United States, the first one in 1791, I believe, 1797. Benjamin Franklin had just gotten back from the, uh, and I shared this on a podcast one time, Benjamin Franklin had just gotten back from the French Revolution. He'd been negotiating a peace over there. And he comes in and he takes the Quakers' petition. They had worked on this. And they said, look, it's time to make all men free. It's time to make all men free. And what you saw there was the division between the Pilgrim's Colony and the King's Colony of Jamestown. And you saw the line split right down the Congress. In fact, it almost ended the nation right then yes. and there. But Franklin came in with the Quakers and the and uh, uh, the Puritans and said, "Guys, every man, regardless of skin color, 
is meant to be free. These are God's children that you are oppressing. And the reason I say that's one of my favorite moments is because you can see clearly good men fighting evil in that moment. And even though you have this terrible decision to ally with these folks who still love slavery, you're hoping, Franklin was hoping for a day when it would change. Washington Jefferson wrote that they hoped that there would come a day where they would be able to change slavery. They did not see that in their lifetimes. They saw it about 50 years, 60 years after they died. Mm -hmm. So it took a while. So just in context, it took a while but they were part of the abolitionist movement. They pushed for that. That's something that we all came over because the whole European and, and African uh, uh, culture was set up in this horrible thing we call slavery, which is different from what the Bible, you, the word slavery in the Bible refers to an indentured servitude, very different thing uh, right. in the Old Testament. But what we're talking about here was chattel slavery. And they saw that horrible chattel slavery. And why I love that moment so much is because, again, it shows the difference, the two different Americas warring inside the new nature of Christ and the old nature of man. That's why it's my favorite. Uh, go ahead and tell us your favorite moment from the formation of the nation of America in the comment section down below. And tell us why it's your favorite. Thank you all. Love you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.